does Revelation 3, 15 through 17, mean that we can lose salvation? And I'll, I'll read those verses for you. <clears throat> I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Okay, so I, I've studied these, these I, the Revelation 2 through 3, there's uh, many, I call, I call them mini epistles to seven different churches, and I've spent a lot of time really thinking about these because they, they're just a little strange. Um, they're, I, you know, I'm trying to make sense of it. How, what paradigm should I apply to understand them? And the only paradigm that I that I've, I can apply that makes sense is essentially, you know, each church is almost like a, a like a little mini Israel. I'm, it, t hear me out. So, like Israel, for example, they were they were God's people, but at any given time, God God always spoke to them corporately. He didn't typically speak to individuals. Although he did periodically, but he generally would assess them corporately. And sometimes they're doing okay. Uh, well, not really, but sometimes they were, you know, uh, super rebellious. And some there, sometimes they were less than less than rebellious. Um, and so I think that same paradigm in in terms of how God's addressing them, uh, and also also too, when God addressed Israel, He often would bring up their past, He'd bring up their present, and He'd bring up their future, and. I think that's exactly how we should have approached these, how, how God's assessing these individual churches. He's speaking to them corporately, and he sometimes refers to their past, their present, and their future. Um, and, uh, you know, the, because we, and also too, is that, you know, every, every church is likened to a lampstand. And so the lampstand is, is a, is a light to the world. And so, uh, it's important to understand that, again, God's not necessarily speaking to individuals here in all these cases. He's speaking to the church at large, and sometimes he's referring to their history, their present, and their future. So, uh, one thing that's really interesting about this Laodicean church is they uh, had a medical center uh, that specialized in eye salve and had a prominent wool industry famous for its glossy black garments that added to, to their material prosperity. So let me just read this whole uh, little epistle here real quick. It, it, so it says, and to, the, and to the messenger of the church of, Lio, uh, of the Laodiceans write, These things say the Amen, the faithful and, faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth, because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, I have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy me, buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may become rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that you, the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and, and dine with him and he with me. So think of this as, as again, I think, he, he, again, Christ is, is addressing this church and in his assessment, he's basically including in his assessment their past and their present and their future. And so, um, again, it, it's really the things that he says to this church are very specific to that church. Um, and I, I, sometimes it can help to understand a little bit of background about this church. So, for example, we talked about earlier, he says, uh, you know, buy from me eye self so I can anoint your eyes and white garments. Buy, buy these white garments from me. Well, it's I don't think it's a coincidence, again, that uh, this the church of Laodicea, that area, had a medical center that specialized in eye self and a prominent wool industry famous for its black, glossy black garments. So you think of black, that's usually not a good thing in, in the Bible. And it was, it, it, they, these, this eye self and these, this uh, garment industry of black shiny garments, uh, I think a shiny too, that's a, you know, makes you stand out, like, look at me, hey, aren't I fancy? Um, it added to, to their material prosperity. So they, they were, uh, you know, 
fat, uh, happy, or what do they call it? Uh, fat, rich, and happy, essentially. And again, that's, you know, that's essentially what Israel had become. They, they thought that, you know, you know, they thought, for example, when they were, the disciples were shocked when, uh, God said to them, uh, you know, it, it was easier for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than a, than a, it was easier for a camel to, uh, 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 enter through a, 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 a an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And they were shocked by that because they thought of that in that day, the, the Jews, that uh, when someone was materially prosperous, that they had God's favor on them. And so again, this is a, basically what this church has become too. It's a, it's a prosperity gospel a, a church essentially. And so again, they, they became, uh, they became again, rich, fat, and happy. And, uh, they really didn't, they'd forgotten about God, essentially. So it's also important, too, that every, everything in the Bible, everything, everything even in the, in the uh, opening statements where it says, these things says to Amen, the faith and true witness, the beginning of creation of God, every, in the opening of every letter, Christ gives a different um, description of himself. And that description is revealing, uh, he's basically telling them, I'm the faithful true witness and you're not because you are not being a good witness for 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 me because you're not faithful to my word and you're not a true witness because you're you're uh saying I'm rich in need of nothing. Um and so um he's rebuking them for that. You know, they they had a false witness and an assessment of themselves and Christ, the faithful true witness, he corrected that view of themselves. They had a puffed up view of themselves. They thought they're doing great as a church, and Christ said, "No, you you're being unfaithful to me. Your your uh, your lampstand, which is a witness to the world, um, uh, you know, if you're not gonna if you're not gonna uh, be a true witness for me, I'm gonna snuff out your lampstand. I'm gonna take your church away, not your salvation. I'm gonna take your church away." Um, and the majority, uh, uh, you know, thought that that great history of the church and their association with it. So again, this church had a great past. But the I, I believe he, basically the majority uh, uh, people that were claimed membership to that church, they thought you know they they knew that church had a great history and they thought that their association with it and the fact that they saw themselves as rich, they had nothing spiritually to be concerned about with. God, they thought that God approved of them and that they were because they were material pros, pro, materially prosperous, and so that's why God said He urged them to buy from Him and not from the world. Again. They were, you know, they, they, that area of the world sold their eye salve and glossy black garments, but God's saying, don't buy from that. Don't buy from the world. Buy from me. Buy from me, eye salve. Buy from me, white garments. And again, you may say, well, God doesn't make you buy anything. Well, that, that's, you're, you're right on that. But this funny thing is, is that, you know, for, here's a, here's a curious verse in Isaiah. It says, ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters and you who have no money, come Buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. So God, again, to buy from God is, is take it freely. But they weren't taking it freely. They're taking it from the world, not from God. And so, again, uh, it has nothing to do with this church's salvation or individual member's salvation. It's just that this is the condition this church had become. They had become very, uh, you know, they become a poor witness, witness for him, and he's trying to correct that. They had they basically had allowed themselves to become spotted from the world, which is uh, as James says, uh, enmity, friendship, friendship with the world is enmity with God. Um, and so again, I believe that if they didn't make, take corrections, God's going to remove their lampstand. The lampstand, as we learn in in chapter one of Revelation, is the church, is the light, is their witness. He's going to take that from the world. Um, and I believe it says, you know, basically that those who defiled their garments. Who did not have, uh, you know, that's why he says, buy white garments from thee. Their garments were defiled because, again, they had a, a, an impure gospel. Uh, they didn't walk with Christ. And that's why it says, you know, he who uh, overcomes, which is another, uh, which is clearly throughout the Bible, a synonym for or a title of a believer, th th who overcomes will be clothed in white garments and they will walk with him. And why will they walk with him if they, in the future? Because. Uh, the Holy Spirit is in them now, and in that sense, they're wa already walking with God. So, it also, too, is that, uh, I think it's important to remember that churches are like sisters. So, if you read John's epistles, he likens, he calls the churches uh, sisters. Um, 
And also in the Bible, evil cities are also known as sisters. So, uh, for example, uh, the church, the Babylon in Revelation is called the Mother of Harlots. Uh, also, too, uh, in in uh, Jeru God in the Old Testament calls Jerusalem. Uh, he says of them, your sister, Sodom and Gomorrah. So, again, think of these churches as sisters. Um, and I think the reason he says later on in, the, in, in this, uh, the epistle to, to the Laodiceans, why, why would the, uh, you'll see, if you don't watch, uh, I'll come to you as a thief, is that a thief in, in Revelation uh, would, uh, a thief always comes upon the unbelieving world. And so, it, again, what he's basically saying to this church is that if you don't correct your spiritual condition, you'll be a church that's completely dead, no, no vitality, no belief at all in it. Uh, I'm not part of it at all. Um, and that's why eventually I will come to you as a thief because God always comes to, uh, to unbelievers as a thief because they're not suspecting him. They're not watching. Um, and so, uh, and so one other thing I want to say to, oh, I also want to say to you the, the, I think that another paradigm that's important when you're reading these epistles, these mini epistles of Revelation two to three is that we learn from first Peter that the judgment, uh, God judges his people first. So, uh, Judgment comes upon the house of God first. So that's exactly what you're seeing here. In all these mini epistles, you are seeing judgment that God is making on this church. And they all have um, uh, a parallel to uh, later on in Revelation that's against the world. So right now he's, he's, he's judging this church. And there's a bunch of parallels to these judgments to the greater, what I believe is the greater, tri the great tribulation that's going to come upon the whole world. So you see parallels like, the harlot. Well, in, in in you see the harlot, for example. Well, the harlot would be Jezebel. There's a there's a uh, a church I can't remember which one it was. I don't know if it's Thyatira, where he says, uh, "You you uh, you tolerate that woman Jezebel who teaches my uh, my servants and seduces my servants to commit sexual immorality in uh, sacrifice things to idols, etc." There's uh there's Balaam who, who's likened to the false prophet. There's all kinds of parallels to in revelation two through three that uh, that are a greater um expression in the great tribulation against the in the world so again i think the idea that you keep in mind is that god judges his people first before he judges the unbelieving world and that's exactly what you're seeing here uh and so i think it's an important thing to keep in mind so before the, the great tribulation breaks god's going to is judging his churches and um the thing about the lukewarm church again the lukewarm, hot or cold, uh, it's important again to also understand the the the, uh, uh, the historical context of the Church of Laodicea. The site of Laodicea was chosen for for its position at an important road junction. It lacked a natural water supply, for there are no springs on the site, and the Lycus River dries up in the summer. The remains of a remarkable aqueduct of stone pipes indicate that the people derived water from a source. From a source south of the city, perhaps from the hot mineral springs near Denizili, the modern town five miles distant. This would have cooled only slowly in the pipes, and on arrival, the supply would have been tepid and its effect emetic. The people of Laodicea had built an aqueduct to supply their city, but the water was lukewarm and impure. The remains can still be seen and thick up deposits of calcium carbonate, carbonate inside the pipes witness plainly to the worth of the water which once flowed through them. The words of Revelation 3, 14 through 15 must have hit home powerfully in Laodicea. The writer said the church was as useless and distasteful as that bad water. So again, reason Christ says, uh, I'd rather have you hot or cold. Well, hot, I think essentially means you're, you're on fire for the Lord. And he can work with you. But if you're cold, I think it means that you're basically almost like you're basically an unbeliever. At least he can work with unbelievers as well. But people who think they have the truth and are different to the truth, those people are worthless. They're, they're, they're not good for anything. They're, just, they're, you know, for many reasons. They can be teaching false doctrine or they just don't care anymore. Uh, you can't work with, the, with, with such people. And so that's why I think he says, I'd rather have you hot or cold. Um... And again, I, I, there's so many other things I could say about this, but uh, I, I think one thing that's really important, he says in verse 19, after he says, you are poor, miserable, and blind, he says, 
As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Well, we know God only chastens believers. So he's re he's rebuking these believers of the church, if there are any believers in the church. And in fact, it looks like it's, it's quite dire that they're not there at this point, at this letter, there were not many believers because it says, therefore, uh, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. So here you see Christ outside the church knocking, but no one's letting him in. W whatever's going on in that church, Christ is not part of it. He's outside of it. So there's he they they've been cut off from the spirit completely, uh, essentially from their in terms of fellowship and the and the uh, you know the, the spirit's witness and, and influence on that church. Again, they they become. Uh, fat and happy and blind to their own spiritual depravity. Um, again, they probably had a great past, but they are in, in, in danger of dying and their church, the lampstand being taken from them again, essentially. So um, I, I think that's, uh, you know, again, it's not a loss of salvation at all. It's about, it's, it's a really, this, that those verses are really a warning that if you don't uh, repent and be zealous for the gospel, uh, he's going to take their church away. So I don't think that's any surprise that that's what God should do. We, God, we don't want God, we don't want a false witness for Christ in the world. We want God to judge churches that are not doing, that are misrepresenting him. So uh, I think we'd all agree with that. Okay, thank you. Well, you, you covered a lot of ground, so I won't repeat uh, those points, but I let me just illustrate this. Uh, this is hot coffee. Mm. This is cold. That's good too. We like drinks that are hot or cold, but when something becomes lukewarm, it's not appealing to us. Uh, sometimes it's disgusting. You want to spit it out. Uh, if you want to know about salvation, you read the Gospel of John, Romans, Ephesians, Galatians. You don't read the book of Revelation to learn about salvation. This is not about salvation, certainly not about losing salvation. It's just the idea that you know, what he's saying is that uh, if you're, see, I, I don't agree that if you're hot, I used to think that I'd rather you be hot. Well, uh, that's not on fire for the Lord. That's what I, my first interpretation was it many years ago. And cold was, uh, well, cold is not bad. We like cold drinks. We like hot drinks. So co cold is not that you're not interested. It's like you have no passion. And uh, hot is you have passion. You're on fire for the Lord. This is the, a lot of people interpret that way, but I don't think it's intended to be interpreted that way at all. Uh, it's just that he's just saying that, if you were hot or cold, uh, you know, you'd, you'd be desirable. But uh, if you're if you're lukewarm, you disgust me. And so that's that's why he's making the point is that uh, nothing to do with their salvation, but they're disgusting to him. This, this is one of the churches. There's two churches of the seven that he has nothing good to say about them. And that's that's one of them. Um, but uh, I, I think. Uh, I've come to the conclusion really over the last couple of years, and especially recently, that uh, the book of Revelation, um, it, the first three chapters are about these particular churches, the situation there, and uh, some of that can be applied broadly to other churches, uh, even churches today. Some churches are like one or another, and a lot of churches are a mixture of these different types of churches. But that's all we should really be uh, getting from the first three chapters. Uh, the the but chapters four through nineteen. Uh, this is not about some future event that we'll have to still two thousand years later we're still looking forward to it. These are things that were prophesied that were just about to happen, and it's all about uh, Jerusalem and the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, and then when we get to chapter twenty and beyond, it's about you know the end of the world. And uh, that, that becomes relevant to, to us. Um, that's it in a nutshell. And if you want the details on that, so 
to know why I'm convinced of that, then go to my playlist on eschatology. And um, uh, I added 52 videos from a teacher named Bruce Gore. Uh, 52 videos, each one is about 50 minutes long. So there's a lot of content, but he, he, the first 10 videos, he goes through the entire history of eschatology from the beginning of the church to present time, how all the people viewed eschatology, the different viewpoints and different theories that, that were developed throughout church history. Uh, but then when you get to his 11th video through the 52 video, he goes through Revelation's verse at a time and teaches on it. And it's, uh, I've watched many people do this now. I've watched many experts teach Revelation a verse at a time. Uh, and I've heard it from every different angle. Uh, but this is the one I think is correct. Now, I know you're probably not going to do it because there's not that many people that are really that serious about studying this. But if you are someone like Hendrix, for example, Hendrix, he actually watched all the videos on my playlist, 50 hours in heaven. Uh, but there's not very many people who are going to take it so seriously that they're going to be willing to watch something that's 40 or 50 hours long. But I, I think until you do that, you're going to miss the boat on Revelation. So if you really want to understand it, that's what you need to do.